Merry Christmas, everybody. Maybe you've just finished opening up your presents and the kids may have just started playing with their gifts, but I'm thankful that you have taken this time to remember the real reason we celebrate the holiday, the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God chose to become one of us, to bring us hope and an eternal life with Him. It's exciting news and we have a great service planned to get your focus on Him. We're going to be celebrating communion together, so maybe grab some bread and some juice so you can be a part of it. Christmas is also a time of giving, so even though you aren't here, you can participate in the offering by clicking on the Give button. So gather the family around, grab some hot chocolate, some coffee, and let's worship together. Remember to log into the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. You may be separated from us by distance, but we can join together to praise Him as a body of believers. And after the message, I'm going to be right back to pray a blessing over you and your family at the end. I hope you enjoy today's special service. Away from the noise Oh, with you
Walking around this world I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your this is my confidence You never failed me yet I know the night won't pass Your will will come to My heart will sing your praise again Cause Jesus you're still now Keep me within your life My heart will sing your praise again Sing your promise. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. Just thank him for his faithfulness. Oh, you never failed. We lift you high and low. Lift you high and low. This next part goes like this. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. But I believe. I see.
your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never failed your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your this is my confidence you never fail you never fail Lord come on just lift up some praise right now to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Amen. Amen. thank you Lord thank you Lord at this time we want to take communion not have a chance to receive your communion element, raise your hand, our ushers will get that to you. The night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples, and he said, this is my body, which was broken for you. How many of you are thankful for the cross, thankful for what Christ has done? So he said, do this in remembrance of me, and what a great time to remember what he did for us on the cross, what he sacrificed. So as we partake of this bread, may we re remember how his body was broken for us. Go on and take heat. In the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. The blood of a new covenant. The blood of a new start. Sins being forgiven. What a mighty God we serve. May we go in and take a drink and remember his blood that was shed for us. All it took was one drop. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you did on the cross. Thank you for the salvation which we possess. Help us to be a witness for you and see other people come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord. Jesus, 
Everybody, wasn't that an awesome worship experience? I hope you felt the presence of God like I did. As you're settling in to get ready to give in the offering, I want to remind you of a couple of great things that are happening here at Faith Church. First of all, on January the 8th at 5 p.m. in New York City, we are opening our new Harlem location. It's going to be awesome. 5 p.m. that particular night, PS92. The information about the address is on the website. You can check it out there. Go to it. We want you to be a, a participant in that. We want you to come on out. If you live in New York City, join us that particular day. It's going to be a great, great time. The Lord has given me a special word for that evening. We have a great artist joining us, gospel artist by the name of Micah Stampley. If you live in the Connecticut area, you can sign up and come on down on the bus with us. Don't miss it. It's going to be a time of great celebration to see what God is going to do in the Harlem area to change the city. Also, I'm excited about our new series in the upcoming year. It's called Banner Year. How to have the best year of your life. If you haven't had the best year of your life yet, get ready. We're going to teach you how to in this new series. So mark it on your calendar. Show up January the 8th for our Harlem Grand Opening and then the following week for our new series called Banner Year. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the service. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth.
Christmas Eve, it's an awesome time. I love Christmas Eve. Maybe you do too. For the Santora clan, we have a ritual. We have traditions that we practice every Christmas Eve. It revolves around us being Italian. And basically what that means is that everybody comes over my house, which I love because, you know, then you don't have to travel on Christmas. And that's, that's wonderful. So everybody comes over my house after church, and uh, we eat fish. All the Italians out there said amen, right? So all you do on Christmas Eve if you're Italian. Now, if you all don't know nothing about that, we forgive you that you're not Italian. We know you want to be Italian, but we eat fish, right? But we don't just eat regular fish, you know, grilled, plain fish. We, we kick it up a notch. We elevate it to a whole nother level. And here's the way you elevate fish. You just put it over pasta. Anything over pasta is amazing, right? And so we do calamari over pasta. We do it fra diavolo. We do it on the side. We put it over these things called frizzels, which are these really, really hard biscuits. And if you eat them by themselves, you're like, why would anybody eat this thing? It's like you bring break your teeth on it, but we put the calamari over that. We do linguine white clam. We do something called boop. Anybody know what boop is? You got no Italians out there? You don't know nothing about boop? It's octopus, right? You know, you cut it all up and you mix it in with celery and onions and this kind of thing. And, and then we do shrimp and we do fried shrimp and we do shrimp cocktail and we do shrimp scampi. And then for all the relatives that don't know nothing about how to eat good, we make them a side of meat and potatoes, right? And, and of course, we also have the assortment of our appetizers and we have a dessert uh, area where it rivals any wedding at a Venetian hour. I mean, we just eat and eat and eat. And then after we're all done eating, we sit around the Christmas tree and we exchange gifts, and then everybody goes home around 12 o'clock at night, and me and my wife are left with the mess. Mostly her, though. And then my job is to take all the presents that we're hiding out in the spare bedroom underneath blankets and bring them underneath the Christmas tree. And all you guys know that after you are stuffed where you can't even move anymore, the last thing you want to do is take like 20 trips up and down the stairs to bring presents down. And so that's what we do. And the kids, they go to bed. And of course, they're excited. You know, they go to bed dreaming about what Santa is going to bring them. And it's a day of an, and a night of anticipation. And maybe your Christmas Eve looks something like that. Maybe you don't eat fish. Maybe you eat other things. And maybe relatives come over, whatever it is, we often can look at our Christmas Eve experience, and if we're not careful, we overlay that into the text, and we think that Mary and Joseph's Christmas Eve experience was, was something like that as well, and we don't realize that their Christmas Eve was not quite as pleasurable as our Christmas Eve, and so what I want us to do is I want us to imagine what it was like through the eyes of human reality for Mary and Joseph that first night before Christ showed up. And so let's jump in. First of all, on the night before God shows up, number one on your outline, conflict can become unusually prominent. Conflict can become unusually prominent. Here's Mary. She gets this big angelic announcement. The angel comes to her and says, you're highly favored, Mary. Blessed are you among all women. You know, you're going to give birth to the Messiah, and uh, you're going to bring him into the world and life. And it's almost like we read that and we go, wow, this is awesome for Mary. Mary then is, how could this be? I, I, don't, I don't get it. I haven't even slept with a man. And, and the angel says, well, that's okay. You're going to have a child, but you're going to remain a virgin. And somehow she gets her mind around that thing, and she trusts God even though she doesn't understand. And then she has to break the news to Joseph, and you remember what happened. Joseph goes on tilt, and he just storms off, and he wants to put her away. And the angel appears to him, sets him straight, and they are reunited, and it feels so good. And then all of a sudden, you know, it seems like things are kind of back in order. And then there's this census that is issued. And everybody's got to return to their own hometown, right? And so Joseph goes to Mary, and she's eight and a half months pregnant. And, and he says, well, we got to go to Bethlehem. And, and 85 miles to Bethlehem on a donkey down mountainous terrain while you're eight and a half months pregnant. Ladies, how many of you want to sign up for that, right? And so you got to imagine just for a minute. I know we have this, this image of Mary that she is this, this perfect woman in every way. You know, that she smiles and skips through life no matter what kind of experience she has. And when life gets hard, she just sings and trusts the Lord anyway. But I just want you to look through the lens of human reality for a moment of what a woman who is eight and a half months pregnant who just gets news that she has to get on a donkey and go 85 miles to Bethlehem. Meanwhile, she's experienced the embarrassment and the shame of everybody looking at her and thinking, you're anything but a virgin right now. And imagine what that lady would be like. I would say she would be understandably a little bit irritable. I would say she would be understandably a little difficult to be around. 
around during that time. Now, this may not have been, but it's my experience. This is the way that I'm looking at this thing. And so I can imagine she's on the donkey, and they're going, and Joseph is trying to settle her down. Don't worry, honey. I know just the hotel when we get into my hometown. I remember it from when I was a kid. We're going to go to that hotel. It's wonderful. The hotel will treat you like a queen. They have a spa there. They have room service there. I mean, you're going to get a massage when you get there. And, and you could just see Mary kind of just be like, it better be like that when I get there, you know? And so they put, roll up to the hotel, and, you know, Joseph parks the donkey and tells Mary, just wait right there, and I'm going to go inside and get the reservations all taken care of. And he goes inside, and he comes out, and he's got his head down. He's walking over to Mary, and you can see Mary looking at him. What now? Honey, um, they don't have a room for us. Well, didn't you make a reservation? I mean, come on, the least you could do, I'm eight and a half months pregnant here, riding on a donkey. You mean I have to do everything eight and a half months pregnant? Couldn't you at least make a reservation? And I can see Joseph saying, well, honey, I tried, but you know I have an Android phone, and I couldn't get through. And that's just what you have to do. You have to be a techie, right? I told you to use the iPhone, but no, you got to go buy one of them phones that blows up on everybody. Well, don't worry. Don't worry, honey. Don't worry. I managed to get us accommodations somewhere else. You could just see Mary saying, okay, let's go to that hotel. Joseph puts his head down again and says, it's a barn. What? What, what did you say? It's a, a barn. Did you say a barn? Y yeah. I said, it's a barn. You mean to tell me you think that I'm about to give birth in a barn with those stinky animals, with them smelly animals, and not have any place to lay down and be comfortable or anything like that? You must be out of your mind. Here's the way that I picture that first Christmas Eve. I picture this couple that has been chosen by Almighty God to be having a lot of conflict. Now, I realize the Bible doesn't say any of what I just told you, but here's what it does say. It does say, while she was eight and a half months pregnant, she had to go to Bethlehem. That wasn't an easy journey. It does say that there was no room for them in the inn. And it does say that she had to give birth in a barn. And if you think for one moment that their humanity disappeared and they were smiling the whole time and they weren't at each other the whole time and they weren't on edge the whole time, you have another thing coming to you because guess what I found out? God uses imperfect people. He uses us in our flesh and in our humanity to do amazing things. But conflict, that particular night, I believe, was at an all-time high on the night. Before God showed up, conflict was abounding. But number two on your outline, on the night before God showed up, circumstances, and this happens in our life, often contradict the promise. I mean, think about this. And I wish somebody who's ever been through anything, who's ever seen God show up would say, Pastor, I know what you're talking about right now. I know that oftentimes when I least expect God to show up because circumstances and situations look anything uh, but what God has promised in my life, God seems to surprise me. I wish somebody would say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. The night before God shows up, circumstances often contradict the promise. I mean, think about this. All throughout the Bible, Joseph is promised a palace, and the circumstances are a pit and a prison first. Abraham is promised to be the heir of, you know, the father of many nations, to have all of these children. And when he's 100 years old, he still doesn't have an heir. David is anointed to be the next king, and he finds himself being manhunted by his father-in-law to kill him. Gideon is called a mighty man of, man, uh, uh, of valor, and he finds himself hiding behind a wine press. Elijah is promised that it's going to rain and the drought's going to be over, and he looks up in the sky, and all he sees is a cloud the size of a man's hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are promised protection, and they wind up in a fiery furnace. Moses is promised that God is going to deliver through him the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity, and when he leaves, he is being hunted by the Egyptian army, finds himself stuck between them and the Red Sea. And Jesus promises Jairus, you remember him in the Bible, that he's going to come and heal his daughter, and while they are going, they get word that the daughter is dead. How many of you know that oftentimes on the night before God shows up, that the circumstances contradict the promise of God? Look at Mary's situation. Here's the promise. The angel comes to her. Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Then the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. 
for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He'll be great. He'll be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Look at the circumstances and look at the promise. Here's the promise. You're highly favored. Here's what Mary's looking at. He's saying, well, if I'm highly favored, how come I'm constantly fighting with my fiance right now? If I'm highly favored, why are, why are people looking at me as if I'm not a virgin? Why are they looking at me as if I'm anything but a virgin? If I'm highly favored, how is it that I have to ride 85 miles on a horse when I'm eight and a half months pregnant? If I'm highly favored, how come there's not a room for me in the end? If I'm highly favored, why do I have to give birth in a barn? See, circumstances on the night before God shows up often contradict the promise of God. So much so that we'll often question our favor, our faith, and even ourself. On the night before God shows up, number one, conflict can become unusually prominent. Number two, circumstances often contradict God's promise. And this is the one that gets everybody all the time. And number three, God often goes silent. Anybody ever have that happen to them? When, when you seem to need God the most... God just stops leading, guiding, talking. It's almost as though he disappeared. And in the text, I love this verse, verse number 7, it says that they couldn't get into the inn, by the way, not because they didn't have money. Have you ever heard that before? Well, Jesus was broke, and the reason why he had to, he had to give birth, in a, his parents had to give birth in a barn is because they didn't have any money. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says because there was no room for them in the inn. In other words, they tried, they had the money to pay for it, but the innkeeper said, sorry, full. But here's what I love about that text. Can you hear the door of the inn slam shut? On the night they needed God the most, they face a closed door. Have you ever had that happen in your life? On the night that you need God the most, God, there's a closed door. God, God stops speaking, and, and, and even though you're crying out, the only thing that you can hear is the echo of your voice, and, and it's loud, not because God is speaking, but because of the deafening silence. On the night before God showed up, conflict was unusually prominent. Circumstances were contradicting the promise, and God goes silent. Here's what I believe. I believe I'm talking to somebody right now. Somebody who, from your vantage point, Everything you're doing, everywhere you're going, you're running into conflict. Every place you look, you see a problem and not God's promise. You call out to God, and instead of hearing Him, you hear only yourself. If that's you, then listen up, because I want to give you three things to encourage you today. On the night before God shows up, remember this, number one, that God is active even when He seems absent. That God is active even when He seems absent. Think about that closed door in the inn for just a moment. I mean, it, it, we don't know this, but it was part of God's design. From Mary and Joseph's point of view, it made no sense that the birth of the Savior would take place in a stable. They were thinking palace. They were thinking Ritz Carlton. They were thinking comfort and ease. They, they, were, they weren't thinking bed of straw. They weren't thinking cradle as a, 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 as a manger. Crib confused them that it was, a, it was an animal's feeding trough. None of this was, was registering for them. They couldn't see how this could make any sense. But how many of you know that when it doesn't make sense to us, it always makes sense to God? Because God sees the big picture. God sees beyond our present to our entire plan. He sees our whole Whole future. God doesn't have a, just a good now in mind for us. God has a good now in mind for us, a good later in mind for us, and a good future in mind for us. Matter of fact, Jeremiah 29 11 says this, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a bright future. You say, Pastor, well, why do we see that here? See, to them a stable was preposterous, but to God it was perfect, because where else would a lamb be born. You see, Mary and Joseph lived in a time where they understood that your sins could not be forgiven unless the blood of an innocent lamb was shed. And see, God loved his people so much, he loved us so much, that he saw that we were away from him. 
And so he had to become uncomfortable in himself so that we can eventually become right with him. And so he's looking at Mary and Joseph are thinking, you know what? What we really need is we really need a nice room in a really good hotel right now. And God is looking and saying, no, all that will do is meet your temporary need. But I want to do something for you that will set you free forever. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you give birth in a stable because that what you're going to give birth to is going to be the lamb that is going to be slain on your behalf so that you can be right with me and have a future that is amazing. See, here's what you need to understand. That even when it seems like God is absent, he's always active. And how many of you know that even those closed doors in your life are more than just a closed door? They're, they're a way of God pushing you into the right place. You see, we are so hard-headed and so stubborn, and we want what we want, that sometimes what God has to do is, oh, i got to close this door right here, because if I let you go here, then you'll never have what I ultimately want for you. And so the end of the door, the end of the, the door of the inn gets shut, and they wind up in a stable, but that's exactly what they needed in order to receive the full plan of God. How many of you thank God for closed doors in your life? Even when it seems... Like God is absent. He's active. The second thing I want you to remember is this. On the night before God shows up, God is on the verge of intervention. From our vantage point, on the night before God shows up, the count has begun. The knockout is underway. The situation is hopeless. But here's what God wants you to hear tonight. Those are exactly the conditions the night before God shows up. You see, when conflict becomes unusually prominent, it is the devil's last attempt to stop what God has ordained. When circumstances contradict the promise, it is the devil's final attempt to cause you to doubt God's faithfulness, to which God goes silent. You say, Pastor, well, why would God go silent during a time like that? Because God is not ignorant. God will not telegraph or announce his move to the enemy. God doesn't have to declare right before he does what he's going to do, what he is going to do. Matter of fact, if God gave you a promise way back when, and God has been silent ever since, then you can take heart that God has never changed his mind, and that the only reason why God is not talking is because God is laying in the weeds, and God wants to jump out, and God wants to surprise, and God wants to show up when you least expect him to show up. God is not going to announce what he's going to do to the enemy. God is just going to do it. He's God if he promises it once he's got to bring it to pass listen this is the powerful thing about God if you if you can hear God say something once say pastor how do I hear God just look in the Bible if you can find God promise something once here's the great thing about God God has to bring to pass everything he promises God can't promise and not bring it to pass because if God promises and doesn't bring to pass, then God just lied. And if God just lied, then God would have committed a sin. And if God committed a sin, he wouldn't be God anymore. He would just be like you and me. But God is perfect. God is completely just. God is full of mercy. And God always comes through on what he promises. And so when God gives you a promise, even if you can't hear God anymore, that is a sign that God is on the verge of intervention in your life. And that's why the scripture says this, hold fast to the confession of your faith. Without wavering, for he is faithful who promised. God is on the verge of intervention on the night before he shows up. And lastly today, on the night before God shows up, I want you to remember that God is a God of maximum impact. God is a God of maximum impact. God is a lot like us parents on Christmas Eve. How many parents hide, I don't know if you do this, we do this in my house, we hide the one special gift. Does anybody else do that? Hide. The, I mean, you put a lot of gifts underneath the tree and stuff like that, but the one thing the kid really wanted, if you're, you know, we don't put it underneath the tree. We hide it somewhere else. Now, my kids know this because it's happened so frequently, but we pretend that we didn't get it, you know, and we make them like, oh, man, they, you know, they got all these things, but they're like, oh. You know, but they won't say it because they're grateful for what they got. But we know they're disappointed. They didn't get the one thing that they were talking about the whole time. We hide that one thing. And the reason why we hide that one special gift is for maximum impact. Right? 
As a parent, what do you want more than anything else? You want to see that smile on your kid's face, right? You want to see that kid just, just, just light up. You want to see them be overjoyed. Because what makes you happy as a parent is to see the joy in the life of your children. And here's what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. It says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give good things to those that ask him? And so here's what God does. God is not silent because he's holding out. He's not, he, he's not waiting to the last minute to watch you suffer some more. He's not seemingly disconnected because he doesn't care. God is holding out for maximum impact. He's holding out so that you will know that he's God. He's holding out so he can mark you with an experience that will forever help you to know that God is God and there's none like him. He's waiting for the moment that touches you so deeply that your joy will overflow. He's waiting for the gift of intervention to have its greatest impact on your spiritual formation. God is waiting for Christ to be formed in you. God is waiting for your impurities to be cast aside. God is waiting to see his own image in your life. God is waiting for your story to bring him glory. He's waiting for your test to cause somebody else to triumph. God is not holding out. God is waiting for maximum impact in your life. Here's God's word for you this Christmas Eve. Don't be discouraged when you see conflict becoming unusually prominent. Don't give up when you see the circumstances of life contradicting God's promises. And don't lose heart when God goes silent. Why? Because that means that it is the night before God shows up. And I know that by now some of you thought the walls would fall. And I know that you've been waiting for change to come. But God told me to tell somebody that the night will not last. And his words will come to pass. His promise still stands. His promise still stands. His promise still stands. Would you stand to your feet and sing this with us? Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your this is my confidence, it never fails. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence.
We're about to celebrate the coming of the Lord through our candle lighting portion of the service. And I just want to encourage you that the candle lighting service, I think, just really brings together everything that we just talked about. Because the Bible talks about how Christ was the light of the world and that he came into the darkness of our world and with his light dispelled all of the darkness. And that's kind of how it is. With life as a whole, we go through moments and seasons in life where we experience darkness, night seasons. But I'm grateful for the promises of the Lord that says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel because God always shows up when he needs to. So I want us to just go ahead and prepare our hearts right now to uh, celebrate the coming of the Lord and what that means with our candle lighting ceremony. And so I think we need to kill the lights. Is that right? Ushers, would you come forward? Al, would you light mine, please? As the candles are being lit, I want to read you this portion of text from the Gospel of John. beginning in John chapter number 1, verse 1. The Bible said the Word was first, the Word present to God, God present to the Word. The Word was God in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through Him. Nothing, not one thing came into being without Him. What came into existence was life, and the life was the light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness, And the darkness could not put it out. There was one man, his name was John, sent by God to point out the way to the life light. He came to show everyone where to look, who to believe in. John was not himself the light. He was there to show the way to the light. And I love this way it reads in the message. It says, the life light, Jesus, was the real thing. Jesus is the real thing. He's not a mythical character written in an ancient book that describes events that may have taken place. He really is God who became that sacrificial lamb so that you and I can be delivered from our sin. And any time you think that your night is too dark, always remember that Jesus proved he'll do anything for you when he came and he became that light. Let's go ahead and sing.
Thank you so much for taking the time to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with us here at Faith Church. As I promised, I'd like to take a minute to pray with you and your family. This may have been a great year for you, or maybe it was a challenging one, but one thing remains the same. Jesus is still Lord. So let's pray together. Maybe grab the hand of your family members that are with you right now and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come into agreement right now that all of what Jesus did for us through his birth, through his life, through his death and his resurrection, we'd receive, Father, that we would know the great salvation that we have and that we would let the light of Christ that came that first Christmas morning emerge in our life and shine forth to a lost world. Lord, I pray your best over every single person watching in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. I want you to enjoy the rest of your day. Reach out to bless someone else. I hope to see you next week for the continuation of our Christmas Invasion series. God bless you. Have a very Merry Christmas.